This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. South America, 1909. According to this famous film, a gun battle claims the life of Butch Cassidy. If the film version is right, who was the mysterious stranger who appeared on a Wyoming road 15 years later? A mysterious stranger who bore a strong resemblance to Butch Cassidy. The vast panorama of the American West has always bred large legends. Tall tales abound of outlaws and lawmen who rode into history across the open landscape. Among them, Billy the Kid, Pat Garrett, Cherokee Bill, John Wesley Harden, Wyatt Earp, and Black Jack Ketchum. Time and distance have clouded the truth, but one thing is certain. Few on either side of the law would venture here unless they knew the country well or had good reason to hide. It is August 13th, 1897. Bank robbery is not an unusual occurrence here. But these are no ordinary bank robbers. Known for their speed and daring, they're called the Wild Bunch. <laughs> Leading them is Butch Cassidy. He has herded cattle here and knows every canyon and mesa. For Butch, it was a short step from rounding up strays to rustling and then to robbing. A stretch in jail for a minor offense has settled the direction his life will take. A life he will one day admit was wasted and hurtful to those he loved the most. Butch becomes master of the fast getaway. Relays of horses have been staked out before the job. On fresh mounts, the wild bunch can outdistance any posse. In this way, they have robbed bank after bank over a wide area of the West. Montpelier, Idaho, Winnemucca, Nevada, Telluride, and Denver, Colorado. 16,000, 17,000, 21,000, 30,000 dollars. The separate halls added up to more than 200,000 dollars. By morning, the outlaws have left their pursuers miles behind. horsemen, they climb the ridges into one of their several hideouts, the notorious hole in the wall, or the rugged area known as Robber's Roost. Here, safe from pursuit, a few men could hold off an army. They will rest up for the next job, confident that no lawman will follow them here. These rugged areas of Wyoming and Utah became fortress sanctuaries. Not only did bandits join Cassidy's gang, there were men who turned to rustling because they felt their independence was threatened by big cattle outfits crowding them off the public range. Into hidden canyons went stolen cattle, security against the excesses of the big ranchers. Which Cassidy became a legend not only because of the mystery surrounding his death, but because his special character inspired a comparison to Robin Hood. During his career as an outlaw, a fortune in gold passed through his hands, but he seldom held on to much of it for very long. He seemed to delight in the chase more than the rewards. He gave money to ranchers and townspeople who were in need, and they in turn helped him with their silence. Today, ranchers in the area feel that Butch was one of them. An expert cowhand between robberies, he was respected for his hard work and skill. They don't condone what Butch did, but with their own independence threatened today by big mining interests, they understand some of the forces that drove him. And I found out later that it was Butch. 
So I worked with his brother right here. His brother Joe, him and I are herded cattle together. They wasn't killed in South America, I know that. Our search for where and when Butch did die took us to the remote Wyoming town of Bags. Galloping down Main Street, guns blazing, they headed for the Bulldog Saloon, where they would cut the road dust out of their dry throats with strong whiskey. Restored, they would roust out Tom Vernon, who played fiddle and owned the local hotel. Then, rounding up the available ladies, they would dance all night. Sheriff Ross Moore, today's successor to Frontier Lawman, sums up his town's attitude. People around here thought old Butch was all right. He was a real nice fella, as far as they was concerned. He never done anything to anybody, and he always treated them right and never cheated them. You know, they were outlaws. These people on Snake River would uh, do about anything for them. They'd stop at your place if you had a saddle horse and their horse was tired. They'd, they'd take your horse and leave their tired horse and go on, but they'd always come back. And they never did anything wrong because they knew that if they rode in to this country, they could get a place to stay all night or a fresh horse. He was a good-hearted old fella. He wouldn't kill you. He'd just steal your money. They was good to these people on Snake River. But money in here, you know. Damn it, they was all good guys. For the most part, outlawing was hard and dangerous work. As an outlaw's reputation grew, so did the odds of getting caught. Alan Pinkerton's powerful detective agency assigned famed manhunter Charlie Seringo to take on the Wild Bunch. Though only five feet tall, Seringo could rope, tie, and ride with the best of them. Having spent a lifetime on the Western Range, he was well equipped to track his quarry. The Wild Bunch reacted to this pressure by moving into another lucrative field, train robbing. With Butch's masterminding, they continued to prosper. The Denver and Rio Grande Railway, $8,000. The Colorado and Southern, $45,000. The Union Pacific, 55,000. The Union Pacific responded by forming a special train-borne posse, transporting horses in a baggage car. About this time, Butch started working more closely with Harvey Longabow, known as the Sundance Kid. They shared a wry sense of humor. One day, after a particularly good haul, Butch and Sundance posed for a family portrait with the rest of the gang. It was a joke that would backfire and force them to flee the country. Sporting store-bought clothes and new derbies were cool killer Harvey Logan, polecat Bill Carver, and Butch's pal, Sundance. Butch could barely suppress a grin at what he thought was a private joke. However, the proud photographer displayed the picture in his window, where it was spotted the next day by an amazed but delighted Pinkerton detective who spread the alarm. Hearing this and sensing their luck had run out, the bandits bought tickets on the very trains they once robbed. An elegantly attired trio, Butch, Sundance, and his girl, the beautiful Etta Place, headed for South America by way of New York. The big city in 1902 must have been a dazzling sight to these now rich but still countrified Westerners. with the elite on Fifth Avenue, and Sundance and Etta had their portraits taken at a fashionable salon. With queenly grace, Etta proudly displayed a new and expensive gold watch. A few weeks later, the trio sailed for South America. In Argentina, they worked as cattlemen until they were tracked down by a Pinkerton detective. Once more on the run, they returned to a life of crime throughout Chile, Bolivia, and Uruguay. In 1909, the story got out that Butch and Sundance were dead, killed in a gunfight in Mercedes, Uruguay. The Pinkerton Agency eagerly accepted the story and closed the files on an old and frustrating case. 
But our researcher Mercedes revealed no evidence that such a gunfight ever took place. Butch and Sundance's death a hoax? Perhaps still another way to outdistance pursuers? One day in 1924, 15 years after the alleged gunfight, a lone figure was seen driving up a Wyoming road. As he came closer, he seemed somehow familiar. Could it have been Butch Cassidy returning home after all those years? Many believe Butch Cassidy returned long after he was supposed to have died in a South American gunfight. Oh, Butch wasn't killed in South America. He came back here in 24, and my grandmother seen him and talked to him. So I know he was here. He stayed a day and a half and then left, but he was here and talked to everybody. He come back from there and went down in Utah. He stopped in bags one night. He went up to some of his old places and visited before he left. So I know he's here in 24. One can only imagine what might have gone through his mind if he had revisited the places of his raucous youth. Most of his companions were gone. Harvey Logan, dead in a gunfight with a posse. Ben Kilpatrick, killed attempting to rob a train. Bill Carver, outdrawn by a sheriff in Texas. And the ladies who danced had vanished or settled down. Only memories remained. The memories live on in bags. Recollections of those still alive who remember Butch's nostalgic homecoming. In an old house on the outskirts of town lives a man who was a contemporary of Butch Cassidy's. Now, Alfred Brazell is surrounded by his animals and his memories. <coughs> The dates he gives might be questioned, but he is positive about what he saw. He was not killed because in 1916, as sure as I ever stand right here, that I seen him right here in this store. I seen him with my own eyes. Now, Butch had three pack horses and one saddle horse. They were tied right out in, uh, right out the side of the store. And uh, he said, Ed, that I want you to go and get me three or four quarts of whiskey. Ed says, why don't you do it? No, he said, I want you to go get it. And Ed only had to just uh, uh, step out of the door and go about uh, oh, 50 feet to the saloon. I'd, I'd seen him before. It wasn't the first time I'd seen Butch. Author historian John Rolfe Burroughs has interviewed others who were even closer to Butch. I came through here in 1959 researching a story on the Wild Bunch. Among other people I talked to was Tom Vernon. Tom at that time was 80 years of age, but his mind was just as clear as a bell. And among other comments I have to make at that time was that I had read an article by Arthur Chapman to the effect that Butch Cassidy had been killed in Bolivia, in South America. Tom looked me in the eye and he said, killed in Bolivia? He said, Butch came through here uh, in the early 20s and stayed with me two days. We talked over the old times, said there's no mistake. I knew every one of the wild bunch well. Now an expert historian has found evidence placing Butch Cassidy in this building in the early 1920s. John Burroughs has still more support for his conclusion. I met a man in Rock Springs by the name of John Taylor who had known Butch Cassidy when Butch Cassidy worked in the butcher shop in Rock Springs, and that's where Butch incidentally got his nickname. Uh, Mr. Taylor owned the Ford Agency in Rock Springs, and he said one day he was out in the shop, and here came a Model T, and it was Butch Cassidy. This was in the early 1920s.
He said Butch didn't recognize him and didn't say anything, but he said there was no mistake that he knew him well. Another person who saw Butch after he turned from Bolivia, who knew him very well, was Josephine Bassett Morris. She was his girlfriend. In an old log cabin where she lived alone, Josephine Bassett talked with Burroughs in 1965. Still showing signs of the beautiful girl she had been, Josephine told him that one night in the early 1920s in Rock Springs, Wyoming, Butch and his old friend Elza Lay knocked on her door. said they were both a little out of condition, but we sat around and had a few drinks and uh, reminisced about the old times. Josephine said that was the last time she saw Butch alive. We had one more important stop to make, 300 miles away. In southwest Utah is the wild and beautiful country where Butch spent his childhood, where he learned to ride, where he roamed free, when his name was still Robert Leroy Parker, and he lived on the ranch his father homesteaded near Circleville. Lula Parker Bettinson, Butch's 93-year-old sister, remembers. When Butch came home, he went straight to the ranch, up at the Parker Ranch, because he thought we lived there. And how he wandered around. He, he loved the place. He had grown up there. And uh, he was happy there. Disappointed to find no one there. But he came to town. Hoping to see his aging father once more, Butch picked up his brother Mark and drove to the Parker house in town. His father and Lula came to the door. When Butch drove into the yard, he uh, and Mark got out of the car and uh, walked over to the house. First, of course, uh, he was a stranger. He just thought somebody would come home with the boys. But as they looked at each other, and got closer. They knew each other. And what a greeting it was to have him home again. When I first saw Butch, I looked at him and I thought, oh, he, he belongs here. He's ours, he must be, you know. And yet I didn't know. And my father said to me, he said, I bet you don't know who this is. He said, this is your brother, Robert Leroy. And of course, then it was just really, but my, I felt like my feet, my, I couldn't stand. I was, I was shocked, you know, in a way. So you, it, I didn't have it very long because he's so warm and so wonderful. And was so tickled to see me that it all turned out just right. When he came home, he could talk of nothing but mother. No matter what we would be talking about, he would go back to her. He felt so terrible because he felt that he'd hurt her so badly. And he really did. And he felt it. He couldn't live it down. He said it was a heartache. And my father said to him, he said, uh, you know, my boy, he said, you could have been most anything. He said, I know. And all I've done is make a wreck of my life. He wasn't a bit happy. I think he paid the debt over and over for what he'd done. Butch uh, died in 1937 in the Northwest. And where he is buried, that is our secret. We do not tell it. My father gave us to understand when the word came of his death that there would be never be told because they had chased him. He said they have chased him all his life and now he's going to rest in peace. 
No matter what, I would never tell it. There are many theories about Butch's later years. In Billings, Montana, author Larry Pointer, after years of study, believes that this man, William T. Phillips, who moved to Spokane, Washington, a year after Butch's supposed death, is Butch Cassidy. And the resemblance is remarkable. Phillips died in the Northwest in 1937, and his ashes were scattered over the Spokane River. An added irony is that for years, Phillips tried to sell the Butch Cassidy story to Hollywood. There were no takers. And what of Sundance and Etta? They seem to have disappeared completely from history. Only the legend remains. But legends die hard. We usually believe what we want to believe. Somehow we prefer to see Butch young and vigorous, falling in South America with guns blazing, rather than living out a mundane life. But wherever or whenever Robert Leroy Parker died, in our minds, he lives on as Butch Cassidy. Coming up next, agents confront a Chicago madam on FBI, The Untold Stories. Then on History's Crimes and Trials, police are put to the test by a serial rapist who erases evidence from the scenes of his crimes. And tomorrow night on Danger Central, the Navy dives into deep-sea rescues on suicide missions at 10 here on the History Channel.